If everyone could sit down, please, we're going to get started. Okay, we're going to get started. This is the last session of the day on Galaxy Structure. Our first speaker is Jehan Pertal Tepe. Um, take it away. All right. Hope the mic's working. Everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here to have the opportunity to talk about the amazing past year we've all had. Um, I just start off just to highlight uh, two of the different surveys that I've worn my hat on for the last year. Um, this, both of these surveys have really uh, taken up most of my time um, for this past year. You've gotten already great overviews of both um, from Michaela and Max yesterday, so I don't need to go into any details about the data sets here. Um, but I do want to reiterate the uh, data that's available. So both Sears and Cosmos Web have made it a really important goal to make the data products available to the public so that the community can use them. Uh, so please visit these web pages and download uh, the available data products, which will be updated as new products become available. Um, both teams are on social media when we can. Um, and then I want to highlight the papers uh, that have come out to kind of highlight the survey. Um, so Bagley et al. and Yang et al. highlighting the uh, Sears NearCam and Miri data reduction. And we have an overview paper for Cosmos that you can find by going to this uh, QR code. But today what I'm going to talk about is a story of what we know about galaxy structures and how they've evolved over the age of the universe and what we've really learned from JWST about this over the past year. Um, but first, for a little bit of context, it was nearly 100 years ago when Edwin Hubble first put together uh, what we now know as the Hubble sequence. Right? He was the one that showed that galaxies in the nearby universe tend to have shapes that are either disk-like with spiral arms or are more rounded or ellipsoidal in shape. And we've really held on to that idea for the past 100 years. And it's been Hubble, the telescope, that's really shown us that this has held all the way out to about 11 billion years after the Big Bang. So up to the limits where Hubble can probe rest frame optical emission, we know that galaxies still have disk-like structures and spheroidal-like structures. Though in details, their shapes are different. In the early universe, they tend to be smaller, they tend to be messier, they tend to be clumpier, and there's a lot more going on as they're transitioning morphologically to become like the galaxies in today's universe. JWST now allows us to push to even earlier time periods. I mean, 11 billion years ago sounds like a long time, but there's still a lot of time between then and the Big Bang and when these structures were first coming, to be, coming into place. And so we'd like to understand these early times and what galaxies were like. When did the first structures like disks or spiral arms or bulges in galaxies actually first form? Um, how important were physical processes like galaxy mergers between galaxies in driving their morphological transformation over time? So we all saw this uh, image yesterday uh, highlighting the very first data that came from the Sears data. Um, when the first data dropped from JWST, right, everybody jumped on it, and there were a lot of like, quick things people wanted to know. A lot of people wanted to know, what are the highest redshift galaxies we're going to find? Um, and there were papers on that sort of immediately. And a lot of people wanted to know, what did these galaxies look like? What were their structures? And so these first images really gave us the first opportunity to probe and to see at a time period where we really haven't been able to see this kind of detail before. Um, and so some of our early work showed that Galaxies at these high redshifts, so these are galaxies redshifts greater than three beyond where Hubble can probe, all the way out to redshift of nine, had a wide diversity of morphologies. There are galaxies that are um, disky in shape. There are galaxies that are spheroidal. Uh, there are plenty of things that are messy that seem like they could be undergoing a merger, et cetera. And so we're seeing a wide range just like we do at cosmic noon and just like we do today. And one thing that surprised a lot of people initially was how many things appeared to be disky or have disk-like structures, even at the very early periods of the universe's history. And so to uh, put things in context, we want to compare what we see with JWST with what we've already known from Hubble. Um, and so this graph here shows results from 
Hubble imaging in the near infrared with WIFC3 from candles, um, where we visually classified galaxies over the whole candle survey into whether galaxies had a disk in them, had a spheroid in them, or had um, irregular features in them, as sort of highlighted by examples on the right there. And just to summarize the basic findings um, from candles, is that you see the fraction of disks is you know, at about 45% or so at redshift of three, but it really drops off quite dramatically with redshift. The fraction of things that have a spirit or irregular features likewise also drop off dramatically with redshift. And this drop off is primarily driven by what's happening in this bottom plot, which shows that things that are either unresolvable, they're a point source, or just unclassifiable, meaning they're really faint, you can barely see them in the images, you can't say anything about their morphology, really jumps up at these higher redshifts. And so a big part of, of this is driven by, it's an observational effect, right? We just can't see the detailed structures. And so in comes uh, the JWST data, and we can conduct the same analysis. And so we did this with the first Sears data, um, looking at galaxies, again, redshift greater than three, with a similar morphological uh, scheme. And you see everything kind of jumps up, right? The fraction of disks goes up from about 60% at redshift of three, and then dropping and kind of flattening out to about 30% or so at the highest redshifts. And then the fraction of things with the spheroid or with an irregular are also pretty elevated and seem to stay relatively constant across this whole redshift range. While the things that are unresolved or unclassifiable um, is very low across, across the entire range. And so there's a lot of things uh, going on. There's a lot of observational effects uh, that are here. But one of the main conclusions is that even at early times, there are a lot of things that are disky. There's a lot of things that are messy. There's a lot of things that have bulges. But there are a lot of things that are disky. Um, we also performed SIRSIC fits to these galaxies in order to understand what their SIRSIC indices looked like, their sizes, et cetera. So that's what's shown here um, in the histograms. On the left is the distribution of SIRSIC indices for three different redshift bins. The effective radius here, or the size of the galaxy in KPC, the axis ratio, and then and the last one is the measure of asymmetry. And the black shows the measures for the Sears galaxies, while the colored lines show measurements from a few different cosmological simulations. So what might we expect from simulations these galaxies to look like? Um, these are from TNG 50 and 100, and from the Santa Cruz semi-analytic semi model. And to first order, things agree pretty well. That was the one thing, phew, okay, things aren't too bad. But you do see a few differences, right? The observed galaxies, the black line, um, has a broader distribution in CIRSIC indices. So it has more things that have a higher CIRSIC index than we see in the simulations. Um, likewise, we see more things that are small in size and more things that have low axis ratios than are seen in the simulations. We've also looked at the morphologies uh, using some machine learning tools. And so this is an analysis um, by Vega Ferrero et al., uh, published earlier this year, that looks at the morphologies with a technique called contrastive learning. And so this was tr uh, trained on illustrious TNG mock images, which you can see as the grayscale background in this UMAP representational space on the right. All right so the grayscale shows what regions of this space are populated by illustrious TNG galaxies. And the color points show where our Sears observed galaxies lie. And so there are a couple different conclusions you can draw from this, right? The observed galaxies tend to be, tend to have uh, more compact populations, but also have some that are more elongated than the illustrious TNG population. And some of the galaxies that we classified as disks visually uh, turn out to occupy regions of space where illustrious tells us these galaxies are actually prolated, elongated um, ellipsoids rather than actually true disks. Um, and so this leads, uh, is related to another analysis um, that was mentioned briefly yesterday. Um, but Viraj Panja at Columbia has been looking at the overall distribution of galaxies. Um, so shown here in the top are some examples of these high redshift disky things that are you know, typically low mass. Um, you can see that they're, they're elongated. You might be tempted to call them a disk. They're fairly clumpy. And so the question is, are these really, truly disky? Do they have oblate uh, morphologies? Or are they intrinsically prolate and elongated, and they just look disky because of the angle that we're viewing them on? And so what Viraj has done was model the overall distribution of the axis ratios of the galaxies. That's what's shown here on the bottom. 
um, and a population of galaxies that is inherently prolate will trace a banana on this diagram. So I think banana-shaped galaxies are kind of a theme, right, that we've talked about today. And so the conclusion from this modeling is that the majority of these high redshift, lowish mass galaxies turn out to be intrinsically prolate uh, rather than oblate. So things that are truly disky um, or spheroidal seem to be subdominant. And instead, most of these things that we are seeing as being really disky at these redshifts instead um, may be prolate. We've also looked at mergers uh, visually through these images. So this is just a, a compilation of, of some of the examples. Um, this work is being led uh, by my PhD student, Caitlin Rose. Um, and so we've identified a number of things that look like they're undergoing mergers or interactions at high redshift. And we've been comparing this analysis um, with what we can identify using machine learning. And so we've been using illustrious TNG uh, as a training set uh, with Sears-like noise added to the images. Um, from illustrious TNG, you have information inherently about which objects actually are in the process of undergoing a merger. Uh, so in this case, that's defined as plus or minus 250 million years of the merger. Um, and then we've been testing two different techniques, random forests and a neural network called deep merge. Um, and just for some preliminary results, what we're finding is both of these techniques can accurately classify up to about 60 or 70 percent of mergers. Um, and this seems to be a ceiling. No matter what we tweak, um, things seem to sort of hit that range. You can do better, but it's at the expense of incorrectly classifying non-mergers, right? You can say 100% of things are mergers, great, but you've also misclassified 100% of the non-mergers. All right. Finally, um, I'd just like to leave you with the message that galaxies in the epoch of reionization are well resolved. We're now at the stage where we can study these galaxies in great detail and really understand their physical characteristics, right? We're now beyond the point of just counting them. We can actually say something about them, both their morphology through images, their composition through spectroscopy. And so I'm really excited to see uh, where this leads us in the next year as we start building up larger and larger samples of these galaxies. All right, and I'll end here and just leave you with my summary. Thank you. Uh, hi, when you were looking at uh, your uh, neural networks and your machine learning, uh, did you guys try different uh, architectures for different models that, you know, might give you better results? There's a lot of different neural networks out there that do a lot of different things. Yeah, so this is at the stage of still a lot of experimentation. So we've been trying out a few things and, and, and again, hitting the ceiling. And so I think there are a lot of ways to improve, but we're still figuring them out. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the great talk. So I was wondering if you see a correlation between the disk fraction versus the galaxy mass. Like, do you see more massive galaxies tend to be more disky? I think some simulations predict that. Yes. I, I don't have those plots here. Um, we did make some of those plots a little bit. We don't have a huge dynamic range in the mass once we get to higher redshift. So the statistics are a little bit poorer, but we do see some hints of that trend. When you make the comparisons between the JWST observations and the simulations, are you including selection effects and observational effects like surface brightness dimming? Because that surface brightness dimming is a really large effect at these red shifts. And yep. um, like two galaxies that were exactly the same but looked at with different, mm -hmm. at different red shifts with different amounts of surface brightness dimming would appear to be very, very different objects. I wonder if you Yes. Your comparisons. In, in this case, that's taken into account because we're using um, mock images that are designed from the simulations that are meant to represent real images. So they've had the appropriate level of scaling and noise added to them. Hi. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I love seeing more applications of machine learning and astronomy. Um, I did a paper on star cluster classification and also found uh, kind of around the 60 to 70 percent accuracy which in my case was similar to human to human variation. So I'm wondering if you know kind of what human to human variation for that merger classification Yeah, is. that's a great question. So we, we had 
three people classify each, so the statistics wouldn't be great. So we haven't done uh, that comparison to see how much they vary. Um, you know, but there are obviously things that there's a lot of disagreement. Like people said it wasn't, but I look at it, I think it is. You know, it's it's hard. Um, and I think for it's a particularly hard question for mergers because there's such a wide range of things, right? They're going to be at different stages of the interaction from a completely different view and angle, different gas fractions. You may not expect to see some of the signatures we would normally see with our eyes, you know, for some fraction of these. So it's it's hard, and and maybe maybe hitting a ceiling is is reasonable for some of them. And the last question from online. Yeah, this is from Ethan Siegel, who asks, are there any high-Z galaxies that have been viewed with both JWST and HST, and has JWST caused a rethink slash reclassification of any galaxies because of JWST data? Yes, there are a bunch of them. I won't show you my examples because we're switching to the next talk. Um, but within this field, right, we've looked at the same the same galaxies, so we can have a one-to-one -one comparison. And there are cases where JWSTs change the classification, often because of the improved image depth. So you can see a disk uh, where you couldn't before. Before, maybe all you saw was the bulge, and it was sort of small and compact, and now you see the extended structures. So that's one example, but there's a few others. OK, let's give the speaker your hand again. And we'll, let's welcome Liz McGrath. All right, thank you. Um, I wanted to start by actually thanking the organizers of this conference um, and for putting together uh, a truly inclusive conference and being able to participate in these multiple, multiple ways, online questions, online viewing. That's really great. Um, and I also wanted to recognize the thoughtfulness that went into highlighting all of the exciting work that is being done with JWST by junior members of the field. So um, I think that was uh, two really great things that have been um, happening in this conference. Um, so thank you for that. Um, you can see on my the background of my title slide here is the Sears field overlaid on, uh, imprinted on the um, HST imaging of EGS. Uh, so you can see the outline portion of is the JWST Sears imaging. Um, and this is where uh, I'm going to be talking about this field predominantly, but I'm going to be adding in some other fields as well. This is work that I've been doing with my Sears uh, collaborators, um, <clears throat> uh, studying galaxy morphology uh, in this field. And then as I will say later on in the talk, we're starting to add in some of the other public uh, fields as well. Uh, so um, looking at, uh, at, thinking about the sort of um, advances that we get from JWST, I wanted to start with this slide. Um, to just emphasize really the power of JWST when it comes to studying galaxy morphology. And I'm going to be echoing a lot of the same things that Jehan just talked about um, because we work in very similar um, in very similar aspects of, of galaxy morphology. Um, but um, what I really wanted to highlight here is this um, the advantages from JWST. And you know, in the past, what we were limited to was essentially uh, this wavelength regime here and, and shorter wavelengths. Um, which allows us to get to rest frame optical wavelengths for galaxies at a redshift of about two and a half to three. And that's, that was our cutoff point. And, you know, I want to emphasize the, uh, the need for rest frame optical and near infrared imaging when it comes to galaxy morphology because that is the, th that's what traces the underlying mass distribution of the galaxy, which is really critical if we want to compare our observations with theory. And so now, for the first time with JWST, we're able to probe all the way out to redshifts of nine at rest frame optical wavelengths. That means that now we have the first apples to apples comparison of galaxies across this wide swath of, um, of cosmic time, all the way from the present day out to 500 million years after the Big Bang. Um, so this is really, really important for, for the work that we're trying to do here. Um, so, this slide is just sort of meant to highlight a lot of open questions that exist in, in galaxy formation and evolution, but I wanted to pinpoint here the fact that uh, morphology can actually help us answer a lot of these questions if we have this high resolution imaging data. Um, and so not only do, are we interested in things like how and when the first galaxies formed, but we need to know what they look like so that we can distinguish between different formation scenarios predicted by uh, theory and simulations. In addition, we'd like to know, you know when galaxies obtained their current structure that we see today. Um, and we'd like to also be able to answer questions like how morphology is related to other changes happening in the galaxy, such so as star formation quenching. Um, 
and you know, thereby pinpointing um, various physical mechanisms responsible for these galaxy transformations across cosmic time. And also, how do AGN contribute to this picture uh, of galaxy evolution? And then finally, how do galaxies grow within their dark matter halos? And so these are all questions I think that um, high resolution imaging and morphological data can help us really start to answer at, an, at a new level. All right, so I'm really fortunate, I feel fortunate, and I'm really grateful that JWST has invested so much time early in its mission to wide field galaxy surveys. And I think we're all fortunate to, to be living in, the, in this time period here. Um, and I wanted to highlight the, the variety of these galaxy surveys that exist. Um, and not only exist, but also have a lot of uh, publicly available imaging straight right from the get-go. Um, and so we, we go from, you know, the ultra-wide fields like Cosmos Web that are great for, for getting really rare objects, uh, massive galaxies, quiescent galaxies, that type of thing. Um, we have really focused, deep surveys like NGDeep, which are great for getting down to lower masses and higher redshifts. And then we have surveys that are sort of in between um, Sears and primer fields. <coughs> and I'm, I'm going to apologize, sorry, in advance that I have this nasty cough, and I promise it's not COVID, but uh, it sounds really disturbing, so I apologize if I'm coughing. All right, so um, let me step back here. So we have all these wide variety of, of uh, fields that are great for looking at galaxy morphology across lots of different mass and redshift ranges. And I would argue that we need to really look at all of these fields. We need to combine the data from all these fields to get a, a, a nice, uh, consistent picture of galaxy evolution across cosmic time. <coughs> and in doing this, um, we also need a consistent way of measuring the morphology across these various fields. Um, and so doing, doing, that, doing those morphological measurements consistently across these fields is important so that we can combine these data sets um, and look at this as a holistic picture. All right, so that leads me to what I've been working on, which is I've been running Galfit on um, a number of these fields, particularly in Sears, started in Sears, covering all six of the broadband filters um, in Sears from NearCam, um, <clears throat> and NGDeep as well. We have the same uh, six broadband filters that are covered with, uh, with Galfit. <coughs> and for um, doing this work, uh, I've been using the public, publicly available imaging uh, for Sears, as well as team-produced um, imaging and, um, and photometry and mass catalogs. And then recently I've started adding in other fields. Uh, in particular, what I'm going to show in today's talk is F200W imaging and primer. And for this, I am grateful to Gabe Brammer and the Dawn Center Archive um, for the mosaics and for the photometry catalogs there, which were the sort of basis for the, start, the starting point for the Galfit measurements. Um, I'll note that for, for these images in particular, for primer, how uh, we took those, those um, mosaics and added an additional custom background subtraction just to get the background a little bit more uniform um, uh, so that we can uh, do our measurements consistently across these different fields. All of the fields have empirical PSFs that we have uh, generated by stacking stars in the fields, and we've um, ensured that um, point sources are well fit by these PSFs in these fields. Um, <coughs> galaxies, uh, ghastly neighbors are fit simultaneously or they're masked depending on their brightness. So the brightest ones are fit simultaneously, fainter galaxies are masked. <coughs> um, <coughs> just to give you an idea of some of our results, I'm going to grab some water real quick. Um, some of our results with uh, comparisons to previous data from HST. Um, we have uh, measurements in the same field, in the EGS field from candles. <coughs> I'm just showing you the size measurements. But we see we get really good one-to-one -one correspondence between JWST sizes and HST sizes, at least out to the magnitude limits of the candle survey where we, where we thought the morphological measurements were robust. Uh, so this tends to be the brighter and lower redshift end. I could show you similar plots for Cirsic index and, and axis ratio, but in general we get very good agreement between the two for this uh, brighter magnitude range. <coughs> 
All right, so just to give you an idea, I'll, I'll try to go through this quickly because I don't have a lot of time. Um, just a, a typical galaxy um, in our Sears catalog uh, is, as Jehan mentioned, generally disky, um, elongated, and pretty small, tenth of a, an arc second, which at these redshifts is corresponding to about a kiloparsecond size. Um, all of my histograms here are for um, the F200W imaging, but we have the data in all of the wavelengths as well. And I'll note that the sizes as we look at longer wavelengths, longer NERCAM uh, imaging bands, are, are systematically smaller at longer wavelengths, which was found by Rensus et al. Uh, in a paper late last year. So we're consistent with that as well. Um, <clears throat> so we find lots of disky galaxies, as has been mentioned uh, before. Um, but I'll, I'll note um, that there's this evidence that Jehan mentioned as well from Baraj Pandya, um, that some of these disky galaxy, disky looking galaxies, these things that are um, N of one Sursic indices and really elongated, really small um, axis ratio galaxies uh, may be actually prolate or elongated spheroids. And how Baraj has done this is that he has um, a differential uh, Bayesian model uh, with a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method where he um, is <clears throat> looking at to infer the 3D shapes of these galaxies. And so just to give you an idea of sort of four fiducial types of galaxies um, in this model, so we can have you know, regular spheroids, regular disk disk galaxies, prolate ellipsoids, and then what he's calling oval disks, so disk galaxies, but they're sort of flattened in, in two dimensions. Um, and this is where they fall in an axis ratio versus size plot. And so you can see, obviously, the, the spheroids are round from any viewing angle. Disks fill this region of the diagram. And then the prolate galaxies, the things that are flattened in two dimensions, prolate galaxies or the oval disks, trace out this banana structure in this axis ratio versus size plot. And this is what we see with the Sears imaging, is that galaxies are falling along that sort of banana um, diagram. Which is why, which is the interpretation now that these two things are probably um, contributing a lot to the galaxy, to true 3D galaxy shapes um, in, in that we're detecting here. Okay, I have no time left, so I'll quickly go through this. But I heard someone ask a question about this, um, and uh, just b before, uh, if you look at just the massive, most massive galaxies um, in in um, these fields. We see, obviously, locally, we know the most massive galaxies are all ellipsoids, uh, spheroids. Um, but as you go out to higher edges, what we're finding is, in fact, among the most massive galaxies, disks start to dominate. So what I think is really interesting about this is that JWST is picking out this regime where um, galaxy transformation is, is clearly happening. Uh, the most massive galaxies out here uh, tend to be disks. We still have some spheroids. And then another interesting thing is this unresolved population of, of sources starts to tick up here. And I'll note that I think that these are truly unique objects. It's not just the sort of small tail of the galaxy size mass distribution. Things uh, seem to be unique. Um, and I don't have time to really talk about this, but there was a paper by Guillermo Barro where uh, we showed that these small things um, are likely either really heavily um, dust dust obscured dusty galaxies or obscured AGN. Um, and the fact that they're so point-like and they're best fit by a, a, a straight PSF model, the residuals are consistent with, with uh, a pure PSF, um, really points that to the fact that AGN might be important here. And since I'm really out of time, I was going to show some evolution in the size mass relation. Um, so this is, this is the data from Sears, overplotted. The results from Van der Waal from Candles were consistent with that. But I'll point out that, so uh, Van der Waal only went out to redshift of three, and we can see further evolution in both, prop, both galaxy types, both star-forming galaxies and quiescent galaxies beyond a redshift of three. And if I can go one more, um, uh, here is with Sears and Primer. I did not split by galaxy type here, um, but here now we're going out to redshift of nine, and you can see that this evolution in size mass continues out to the highest redshifts. There doesn't appear to be any um, real change in the slope, but you can see that clear um, change in the and the intercept of the size mass relationship, um, and we get uh, a, a relationship that's consistent with previous studies. So I will throw up my summary, and I will leave it at that, and I'll take any questions. Jose from FIU, from Florida. 
Uh, we teach astronomy but on the, the idea that the uh, galaxy that has disk is because they have strong rotation and the one that has no disk uh, is not rotated. This data confirmed that idea is so, um, so after two, after C equal two, it's a big jump. Uh, so, so um, you're asking about the the ones that are prolate the uh, which one? This one. Yes. Yeah, so, the, so, so we're finding massive disks. In this one, this example I show has actually clear spiral arms uh, at high redshifts. So the most massive galaxies are, are, tend to be disks. Let's continue this conversation after the talks. Thanks. I'm going to do one last question while we set up the next speaker. Or is there an online? Thanks. Um, so do any of these galaxies, uh, because you're in some of these ancillary deep fields, have uh, resolved enough spectra to look at the kinematics and maybe calibrate what some of these uh, disk versus bulge, the rotationally versus dispersion dominated sources? Um, yeah, so for, for a lot of these, we're talking about lower mass objects. Um, so like the ones that Virage is working on are, are generally lower mass galaxies. and so. We need spectra from JWST to, to see whether they're rotationally supported or or rota or, or um, pressure supported systems for like the prolate versus um, disky things. Um, for the massive sources at high redshift, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any um, resolved spectroscopy that would allow us to figure out whether they have uh, rotation signatures or not. Um, yeah, I can I can look. I I suspect not, but um, yeah. Just to be fair to the online folks, we'll take one last question online. Okay, this is from uh, Ethan Siegel again. Uh, is there a relationship between the morphology of these early, most massive galaxies you're seeing and whether there's a correlation with the amount of star formation going on inside of them? That's a great question. Um, I have not looked into that, um, but that is a great question. Yeah, so it's something that we need to look into. Great. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. And let's welcome Ivana Barisic. Is it? Hello, everyone. Can you can I just get thumbs up from the back row if you can hear me well? Okay, great, thanks. Um, so my name is Ivana, and I'm a postdoc at UC Davis working with Tucker Jones. Um, and I'm very glad to have the opportunity today to first present the MSA slit stepping uh, strategy um, for our program and also talk about uh, case study uh, results or case study analysis of one of our targets um, at Redshift 1.1. So to put, uh, to first to put the program in the general context, um, I'm showing you here, so the studies that have been done so far, and I'm showing you here an example figure from Wisniewski et al. 2019. The degree of um, ordered to turbulent motion is shown to um, evolve through cosmic time and also is shown to be dependent on the stellar mass, where uh, galaxies at high redshift, in terms of the degree of the turbulent motion, are indicative of um, non-disk structures and more modern day uh, disk galaxies in terms of the degree of rotational support um, are indicative of thin disks. So basically, in order to better understand the redshift and mass scales at which this transition from irregular clumpy structures to uh, order thin disks um, happens and also to um, I identify the role of accretion and feedback in driving this transition of galaxy populations. Uh, it is necessary to have spatial resolved um, uh, spectroscopic data. And this has been the main motivator for GO2136 program, PI of which is Tucker Jones. 
Um, so this is the program that employs MSA's list stepping strategy in order to observe spatially resolved kiloparsec scale pseudo IFU spectra at the epoch when the modern thin disks emerge, which is uh, between 0.5 and 1.5. Um, with the rest stream optical emission line diagnostics that we gather, we can address a range of science objectives. Um, the main of which uh, that I'm going to present today um, when I come to the case study will be kinematics and metallicity gradients. But you see here that we can also address the structural evolution, uh, find dust attenuation maps and uh, star formation rate maps corrected by those and look into agent feedback and so on. The sample has been drawn from the EGS field, um, which has a wealth of ancillary data sets. Um, so from which we draw out 43 uh, galaxies based on a range of criteria, including the fact that uh, every galaxy that we choose needs to be uh, spectroscopic, needs to have a spectroscopic redshift. Um, also, we apply the stellar mass and star formation rate cut and on top of this, um, so the, the star formation rate and stellar, stellar mass cut are designed in such a way to cover the main sequence and stellar masses uh, across the main sequence, but at the same time to uh, cover bright and uh, substantially uh, spatially resolved nebular emission lines in order to target our science uh, objectives. At the same time, we uh, use the uh, high resolution combination of rating and uh, filter combinations in order to uh, also target the rest frame uh, optical diagnostics. The goal here is to measure the, um, um, to, to be able to resolve thin disk structure, we want to go in stellar velocity dispersions below um, 30 kilometers per second. Uh, so for that reason, we need to be able to achieve the age alpha signal to noise ratio at three uh, RS um, of five. Um, so we do that with this, uh, this filtering grading combination. The strategy, strategy, as I said, was the slit stepping. And I think at this point, it is worthwhile to point out the, some of the differences between the uh, conventional IFU mode and uh, slit stepping and the uh, benefits of slit stepping compared to the IFU. So in order to reach the intrinsic velocity dispersion of thin disks, which is lower than 30 kilometers per second, this is the age alpha signal to noise ratio that we need, so five at three RS. With an eye view that is limited to a single, to observing a single object at a time, we would require eight hours on source to um, get the eye view for one specific, for, for one object. With MSA, with its multiplexing capability, we only require 30 minutes per exposure in order to reach the exact same sensitivity thanks to the uh, uh, two times higher sensitivity of the near spec MSA. Uh, in addition, it is worth pointing out that the slit stepping pattern that we use is sort of a typewriter motion where we take nine steps in the, in the dispersion direction and seven steps in the cross dispersion direction, um, totaling 63 exposures, uh, meaning that the total exposure time for the entire survey or the entire program is 20 hours, making it more than 15 times faster uh, than a conventional IFU would be to build the uh, same IFS data set. It is worth pointing out that this mode of observation is highly uncharacteristic and therefore not supported by the uh, standard space telescope pipeline, at least the one that exists at the moment. Uh, which requires a substantial amount of software development on our end. This means that, so I've been leading this effort to, um, first of all, customize the existing pipeline to fit our needs. So stage one through stage three include pre-processing and post-processing uh, steps. And also a huge amount of effort has been put into designing from scratch a software package that will uh, that designs uh, the cubes and combines the exposures into qubit in the end. A positive thing about all of this is that uh, the software package will be made publicly available so that uh, any and upcoming uh, cycles where, where if anybody decides to use the similar pattern of observing to build their um, high redshift or anywhere. Um, 
uh, sudo i a few cubes, you can, you can rely on, uh, on the package that we're going to release. So jumping into the analysis that has been done, um, on the top panel right here, you can see a slice from the cube around uh, age alpha line, where also the plotted are Sears contours, because this particular target that we, show, we decided to showcase also has near cam uh, imaging. Right in the spiral arm, you can see prominent uh, age alpha uh, emission. So Chris Martinson, who is a PhD candidate at UC Davis, has been doing some of the analysis actually all of the analysis re regarding the kinematic uh, measurements. And first, so he extracted the uh, 1D spectrum from this particular region. So here you can see a, uh, just for show, what the 1D spectrum from that particular region looks like. In addition, he also generated the age alpha flux map, and we're also able to recover then the kinematic maps, the rotational velocity and the velocity dispersion, um, from which, uh, we can tell that the, from which it shows for this particular, uh, for this particular galaxy that the kinematic map reveals a uh, rotational disk structure. Other emission lines can also be mapped. Um, and for example, you can also target the BPT diagnostics, which means that so for this particular target, we don't see any evidence of an AGM, but it, it's a rather a normal star forming galaxy. Furthermore, uh, looking into a 3D model, Chris here has recovered a rotation velocity model, so the dispersion velocity model, and the, um, the model that has been uh, attempted to fit by Galpac 3D uh, supports the um, like a disk model, and we can see here very well that the data that has been observed follows that assumed model uh, very well. In terms of metallicity gradients, studies in the, in the studies up until this point, and here I'm showing a figure from Wang et al. 2020, have shown that um, in the low redshift universe or for modern day galaxies, the, um, the slope um, of, or metallicity gradients are showing the negative, negative slope or negative trend, whereas at higher redshift, so around 1.5 or higher, the metallicity gradient sort of flat out. And the current potential explanation for this is that the presence of mergers or uh, other type of feedback uh, would, would serve to flatten out the gradient um, by introducing a chemostructural diversity uh, in, the, in the galaxy. So keeping that in mind, we can basically, with the data that, that we have, radially map metallicity and examine where exactly the case study that we have falls on uh, this plot. What you're looking at here is a plot that was generated by, uh, by Tucker Jones. So um, what, what he has done is, is he has he's looked at, uh, he's radially binned the spectra from the, from the cube in steps of 0.2 arc seconds. So what is shown here is the most central spectrum and uh, this is the top is the, the outermost. So what, what you can clearly see is the um, radial evolution and emission line ratios. Namely, if you look at the ratio of the N2 to H alpha, you can see that it decreases with the radius, whereas the O3 to H beta increases uh, radially outwards. And in terms of the O3 to N2, um, diagnostic plot. It shows a clear negative gradient uh, across resolution elements. So putting this plot, putting this result back into the context of the figure that I've shown from Wang et al. 2020, the, um, the slope from our case study galaxy falls right here and is in agreement with the um, the simulated enhanced feedback model. So what remains to be seen is for the remaining of, of our sample and across different mass scales, whether or uh, how in support they are with the um, lack of mergers or outflows at that uh, cosmic time. 
here I have my summary slide. Um, so I guess I'll I'll just leave you I I'll leave you with this. Right, slide at the end. Okay. Uh, I'll leave you with my summary slide. The main point of the talk was that the MSA list stepping strategy is highly efficient, highly time efficient in gathering, um, in, in building large pseudo IFU uh, samples being more than 15 times faster than the IFU. Um, and I've shown to, for you the first uh, results for case study galaxy, looking at the kinematic properties and also the metallicity gradients. Thank you. Questions? Hi, um, Mason Ruby from uh, the University of Memphis. I was just wondering, obviously besides having to build your own data reduction software, are there any other downsides to using the, the slit stepping? Um, so the, 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 the downside of using slit stepping uh, would be so when you're looking at the, the SPACs or the resolution, resolution element, um, IFU has sort of the capability of going down to the 0.1 arc second times 0.1 arc second. Um, you can also choose to do 0.1 times 0.2, and this is the capability of the MSA. So MSA goes down to 0.1 times 0.2 arc seconds. The drawback, that would be the, the, the drawback of, the, of using the, the slit stepping uh, method. However, that is sufficient for, uh, for our science objectives and for us to do the, um, the, the kinematic measurements that we want to do so um, across all the uh, spatial elements. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so which kind of master, uh, well, background subtraction strategy have you implemented? Master background, I guess. Uh, so this is, a, this is work in progress at the moment. So the, the, the reason why this is work in progress is because the data has been observed and came in uh, end of March, or actually beginning of, of April. It was like last day of March is when we got the data, or like hands on the data in the first place. And Three months have passed and we have, you know, it's remarkable that three months afterwards we do have the machinery to actually build the queue because the huge amount of effort really has been put into uh, building the software package to actually uh, combine the exposures and create the cube in the first place. Um, master background is something that we need to implement and is not functional yet because I guess the, the main reason why this is not functional with the standard pipeline is because we have a custom uh, number of slitlets per each of our on each of our objects, ranging from three to five, and master, the standard master background subtraction is not functional for anything larger than uh, for the number of slitlets larger than three. Uh, so we need to find a workaround on that, um, and this is for this reason it's a work in progress. So the cubes that and the analysis that we have done here don't have master background subtraction, and the, the results are or actually the data we see are amazing. <laughs> Any online ones? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, let's uh, welcome Kalina Nedkova. All right, uh, hi everyone. Thanks so much for being here, both those of you who are in person and those online. And a special thank you to the organizers for this wonderful opportunity to present some very initial passage data with you all today. Uh, so our passage team is composed of all of these wonderful people listed here, some of whom are here at the conference in person. So if you have questions for us, uh, please come find us. Um, uh, so my name is Kalina Nitkova. I'm a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and I work with Mark Rafalski, who's also the chair of this session. Um, 
And today I want to talk about uh, parallel application of slitless spectroscopy to analyze uh, galaxy evolution. And so here in my title slide, I'm just showing you a very quick example of um, just in one filter, some of the direct and GRISM data that we have. So I want to begin with a brief status update of PASSAGE. So PASSAGE is one of the first uh, pure parallel JWST programs, which meant that uh, we encountered some initial challenges. Um, so for instance, the APT wasn't quite ready for us. Uh, there were certain times when uh, pure parallel programs were placed on hold. Um, and there were less uh, GRISM filter changes that we could uh, apply than we hoped for. So all of this meant that we had less prime opportunities and less settings. However, uh, some of these issues have been ironed out and the data that we did get are absolutely spectacular. And I will show you some examples of this uh, throughout my talk. Our survey is designed to have a deep, medium, and shallow component over there in that plot, I'm showing you the exposure times. Um, you see that for most of our fields, we have exposure times of over an hour uh, in the GRISM. So these are really very deep. So our deep uh, fields have coverage in all three GRISMs, and the shallow ones have several hours of exposure in our Redis filter. And uh, currently, the data reduction is still in progress. Um, <laughs> I'm sure all of you are aware that this is highly challenging. So I just want to give credit where credit is due and say that these efforts are being led by the Hong Meta. Um, so here is an example of some of our data. So here you can see the three grisms in the three different colors. You can see some very nice lines here. Uh, but this example is to show you just uh, some of the compromises that we've had to make. Um, so originally, we had planned to have a direct image for every GRISM, but we had to give one of them up. Um, but still, you can see, uh, regardless of this compromise, we can still do a lot of fantastic science with this data. Um, there are also a lot of benefits of doing pure parallel programs with JWST over HST. So first, you consider your images. You could not do this with HST. Um, and we have up to two orients for our grisms. So you can imagine for this example here, if you disperse the light in this direction, you're going to be contaminated by this neighbor. If you disperse it at 90 degrees, you resolve a lot of your contamination issues. So this is really powerful. And uh, as a bonus, this provides better uh, 2D emission line maps. Um, and I'm happy to announce um, that although parallel fields typically lack uh, deep ancillary data, we were just approved in this most recent HST cycle to follow up seven of our best fields in up to three uh, filters with HST, and the PI of this program is, again, the Hang Meta. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and tell you um, about some of the science that we plan to do and are in the process of uh, doing. So we've heard a lot about Lyman alpha emitters and Lyman break galaxies throughout this conference, so I'm not going to talk about why these systems are special. Instead, what I will do is try to tell you uh, why passage will provide a unique view of these systems. So one of the benefits of pure parallel programs over uh, some surveys like JADES that cover contiguous uh, portions of the sky um, is that we can reduce the effects of cosmic variance. So here I am showing you um, a dark matter uh, density distribution. And you can see that we have all of these fields, which means that uh, we, we reduce uh, cosmic variance. And by having all of these independent lines of sight, we can provide an independent check um, of some of the results that we've been seeing from uh, other people. <laughs> okay, um, so one of the things that we are currently working on, um, these efforts are being led by Axel Runholm and Matthew Hayes at the University of Stockholm, 
is to do this blind search for strong line emitters. So the idea here is to detect galaxies from the GRISM alone. Um, and so you can see uh, just two examples here. Both of these happen to also be detected in the direct imaging. Um, but if you can imagine um, a Lyman alpha galaxy um, at high redshift, we might not be able to detect the continuum. So this is um, really a nice way to search for these galaxies. And here I'm showing you just the spectra. Um, and so when we don't have more than one line, we can't quite get the redshift. Um, but anyway, this is just with one of our grisms. So when we uh, do this uh, with all of our three grisms, um, this, I think, will be quite promising. Uh, one other uh, thing that we're working on is uh, extending the star forming main sequence. Um, so here we have um, star formation rate from H alpha and the stellar mass on the X axis. And with passage, we will be able to extend um, into this new regime over here, reaching 10 times lower in star formation rate and 10 times lower in stellar mass. Uh, but my own interests uh, lie in the mass metallicity relation, uh, which I'm showing you here. So we have um, metallicity on the y-axis and stellar mass. And if you just focus in on this portion of the plot, this is where we were pre-JWSD. So all of these objects here are stacked. So these are stacks of tens or hundreds of up to hundreds of galaxies. Um, and with passage and with JWST, we will be able to probe this uh, new region of the space space. And so um, I'm now just going to loop through a few of our spectra. These are not special. These are not the best that we have. These are just representative of the data that we're getting. Um, and so I'm just going to loop through a few just so you have a sense. Um, so we have nice... O3, H beta, and O2 lines, again here, right. So um, with this, we can measure the oxygen to hydrogen abundances and uh, measure the mass metallicity relation. Um, so again, here, I just want to make the point once again about how good, how much better we can do with HST, uh, JWST. Um, so uh, here I'm showing you results from uh, Rybalski et al. in PrEP. Um, so these are from uh, the deepest uh, Muse Ultra Deep Field. It has 90 orbits of HSG GRISM. Um, and so in my mind, this is really the best that we can do with HST. And so um, the stacks are shown there in blue with the gray points showing individual galaxies. And so you can see one thing to point out is, oh, is that there are no galaxies, individual galaxies below 10 to the 8 in stellar mass. And so here are some very preliminary results with passage. These are individual objects shown there in black. And you can see that we're already beginning to probe this low mass end. Um, and so these are not stacked individual objects that we can measure the metallicities for. And these are results from just one medium passage field. So we have many more to go. Um, and with the deep ones, we'll be able to do much better. OK, so I'm going to put up my summary now. Um, I just want to say that uh, pure parallel programs with JWST are really powerful. And that passage will yield insight into a variety of open questions, a lot of which I haven't had time to touch on but I've listed here, so um, please stay tuned. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll take questions. Hi, it's uh, Mirko Kurti from ESO. Uh, so um, we've also been probing the low mass end of the mass metallicity relation with jades, and we found 
some evidence for flattening of the slope. Are you finding the same with the first passage observations that at is, low mass? Yes, that is a great question. Um, is, so it's too early to say. Um, these are extremely preliminary. Um, but so with the few data points that we have, um, no evidence of that yet. Um, but I think as this begins to fill out, we'll be, we'll be able to constrain that better. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I, yes, thanks for your question. Thank you. Other questions? Oh. Thank you for the wonderful talk. So I guess my question is for these single object detections, especially since you don't have too many photometric points, how do you determine or how uncertain is your stellar mass of these objects? Yeah, really, really great question. Thank you. Um, so I should say that I've chosen this medium field specifically because it falls within the cosmos area. And so we've used some ancillary data uh, to get the stellar masses of these objects. Um, there are a few, so we are deeper um, than this, uh, than cosmos because it falls outside of, this is not within candles. Um, and so for a few of them, um, I've used a relation between um, magnitude and stellar mass. Um, but yeah, most of them come directly from, from cosmos. Um, so when you were showing the spectra, um, the region where you have uh, O3, 43, 63 line, mm -hmm. um, that is grayed out, uh, I guess. I'm not sure why it is. And then are you able to detect 43, 63 line with, with in passage data, passage data? Um, sorry. You, if it is not marked. If, I guess it is because of a, an instrumental artifact. Yeah. So but is it affecting all of your data like that? So this is just where um, the two grisms um, overlap. Um, and so I think maybe I can illustrate this better with another example. But you can see that um, at the edge of the grism, um, the, the spectra are not very reliable. Um, and so that's why this is um, masked out. Um, yeah, within, uh, after Hitchcock, which year? The data are not deep enough to Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, maybe in some of our deeper um, fields that have more exposure time, maybe. Um, but again, this is just one medium field and very preliminary. But thank you for your question. Uh, so a couple of things. I, I'm Alec Hirschauer from Space Telescope. Um, so something that Mirko was mentioning was the flattening of the LZ relation. I just wanted to note that uh, some of my recent work is, is looking into seeing that also locally. But the question I actually had for you was with your, um, you showed your, I guess it's two-part, you had your, your stack spectra. And I was wondering, um, so you also showed mass metallicity using the individual objects. Is stack spectra uh, an element that will be going into your eventual mass metallicity relations? And so the follow-up to that is, are you worried at all about the potential biases affiliated with um, un, um, I don't know, unevenly, mm -hmm. represent, uneven representation of, yeah, okay, but, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the first answer to your question is, yes, we will do stacks. And the second part of your question is we are biased um, in particular to things with higher star formation rates. Um, but this is something that we will have to carefully take into account when we go forward. So thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. And Adam Carnell, if you could share your screen. Uh, go ahead, sir. I will we, interrupt at two good? minutes. Okay. Am I ready to go? Very great. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And thank you, of course, for having me. I'm sorry to be missing the in-person part of this conference again. Um, but I would like to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing, me and my team, over the past year or so, um, working on studying the first massive quiescent galaxies with JWST. Um, so these are 
are galaxies that have kind of reached a mass similar to or larger than the Milky Way's current mass, but in about the first billion to billion and a half years of cosmic history, basically. Um, and they're interesting for a variety of reasons, of which I'll just highlight a couple. Um, in the first instance, these kinds of galaxies are very constraining on our current models for galaxy formation. Um, so this is number of galaxies per unit volume here, and this is a nice plot made by Kate Gould at uh, the Cosmic Dawn Institute showing the number density that we think massive quiescent galaxies have over this sort of second billion years between about redshift three and six here. And what's shown um, with some of these lower points and these dashed lines here is um, some predictions from various different models and simulations of galaxy formation for what these numbers should be. And you can see that these are considerably lower than the data points at the moment. Our simulations are not reproducing enough of these kinds of objects. And this points to some sort of um, missing piece in our theory of galaxy evolution, basically some mechanism that's capable of shutting down star formation in early galaxies during the first billion years that we don't currently have a good handle on, and we want to study these galaxies to find out more about. Another useful property of these galaxies, of course, is that they give us the ability to study um, star forming galaxies within the first billion years in a different way. Um, so this is a nice paper by Kit Boyert um, reporting the discovery of a sort of modestly massive galaxy about 500 million years after the Big Bang. Um, but this galaxy is still very highly star forming. Um, and during the first billion years, we still really don't have a very good handle on lots of different sort of potential pathological phases of star formation, high mass stars uh, in these very early proto galaxies. Um, and these have the potential to sort of obscure um, the signatures of things that we'd like to study, like, for example, the, the actual amount of stellar mass present. Um, and when we go to galaxies that have shut down their star formation, these kind of very massive stars and their associated complexities have all sort of burned off and ended their lives as supernovae, and we're left with lower mass stars um, that formed at the same time, but which we think we understand a lot better. So it's a sort of an alternative approach to trying to understand these very earliest galaxies in a way that's a bit closer to what we already think that we understand. Um, but finding and studying these massive quiescent galaxies in the second billion years has historically not been particularly easy either. Um, and I'll attempt to explain to you why that is by showing you this example here. Um, this is a very faint red galaxy, a little blob here that appears in the um, Candles EGS field and catalogue. Um, so this is a galaxy that we know exists. These are different photometric bands at different wavelengths, and we have several high signal-to-noise ratio detections of this galaxy. So we know it's there, but more than that, it's actually very challenging to say about this object. I've fitted this SED model through it here, through the data that we had prior to JWST, and you can see that there's very little constraint, even on something as simple as the redshift at which this galaxy is at, between about redshift one and eight, there's a huge amount of uncertainty here. And uh, similarly for the specific star formation rate that's shown in the bottom right here. And the basic reason for this is that this is the best available data from HST, um, and the wavelength range of HST is only this unshaded region on the left here. All of this grayed out region, we have to rely on a combination of data from other sources, which just aren't quite giving us the kinds of uh, high signal to noise constraints and wavelength resolution that we need to be able to tell anything about these kinds of very faint red objects. Um, but of course, JWST is designed to fix this problem. And this galaxy, in fact, is in the very first field or one of the very first fields that was imaged by JWST as part of the SEERS program. And when you reduce and fold in the Sears NIRCAM data, it really just fixes this problem in an instant. Um, so we can now see that this galaxy is very, very tightly constrained to be at about redshift 4.3. And it's actually a quiescent galaxy, in particular this F277W filter, for which we really didn't have any kind of coverage previously, constrains this, this very sharp Barmer break that tells you this galaxy is quiescent. Um, and actually, uh, I just learned very recently that this galaxy has also now been spectroscopically confirmed by the JADES team um, with a redshift of 4.3. Um, so that's encouraging. But um, from this photometric study, uh, we had 
this galaxy and actually two others that we found um, in this field, which was considerably more than we were expecting um, out of these very small early data sets. Um, and this gives you a bit of a different perspective on the plot that I put up at the start here, this plot by Kate with the previously thought number densities as a function of redshift for these sorts of galaxy. When you add in the first constraints from JWST, they actually lie up here, way above um, these previous observational results and even way further above the simulations. Um, so this is telling us that actually we have a problem that's bigger than we thought with our current models and that it's even more pressing to try to address these issues. But of course, um, to do that, number densities are helpful, but they don't provide you with all the information that you could possibly want. And really what we would like to be able to do is to study in detail the physical properties of these early massive quiescent systems. And of course, that's what NearSpec allows us to do. Um, so just for comparison, this is some of the best available data pre-JWST. This is, I believe, about an eight-hour exposure um, with Keck and MOSFIRE. Um, and you can see here we have this K-band spectrum that covers a relatively narrow wavelength range and just gives you sort of tentative detections of a few of these absorption features that indicates a quiescent galaxy, in this case at about redshift 4. So what I set out to do with my cycle one program was to pick the most promising and most distant candidate for one of these massive quiescent galaxies, it happens to be this object in the good south field, and to target it for comprehensive single slit spectroscopy with near spec um, in these two filter and grating combinations here. And at the December Space Telescope meeting, I showed a very preliminary version of this, but here is the fully reduced spectrum, um, which is just, unbelievably high signal to noise. It contains this whole forest of Barmer absorption lines that allows you to tell in, in intimate detail the star formation history of this object. Um, so by fitting models through these data, um, we were able to, to do that and to constrain the star formation history. And this is what we get. So on the left, this is star formation rate versus age of the universe with redshift 4.7 on the left here. And then the same thing for the mass of the galaxy on the right. Um, so we think this galaxy basically formed the majority of its stars in about a 200 million year period, ranging from 600 to 800 million years after the Big Bang, around about redshift seven or so. And it had a peak star formation rate of around about 500 solar masses per year, plus minus some significant uncertainty. Um, and it turns out that when you take the number density implied from the area that we found this galaxy in and the number density for submillimeter galaxies that are very highly star forming at around this redshift six, seven or so, they match up pretty well. Um, so that suggests that this galaxy is plausibly descended from something a little bit like a very high redshift submillimeter galaxy. It's also worth noting here on the right panel, this sample from Ivo Labe's paper, um, looking at m surprisingly massive galaxies at high redshift. And this uh, object that we have a pretty good handle on the star formation history of passes through this cloud of points, which indicates that these are potential progenitors here. Although it's worth noting that their number density collectively is much higher than the implied number density for this galaxy that we've observed. Um, so another really interesting thing about this spectrum is that it has this very broad H alpha line here with a velocity full width half maximum of about 10,000 kilometers per second, which implies an AGN in this galaxy. And in fact, a very massive black hole of around about half a billion to a billion solar masses, which is about five times what you would expect um, if you took the local relationship between galaxy stellar mass and black hole mass. So that implies an awful lot of AGN activity, basically feedback from AGN accretion in the history of this galaxy. It's also an extremely compact galaxy. This is near cam imaging of, of this object. And we imply, uh, we, this implies a radius of about um, 200 parsecs for this galaxy. So very, very compact. And in fact, when you figure out the density of this, it's, it's up there with about the most dense stellar systems in the universe. Um, things like the cores of local giant elliptical galaxies, for example, in the centers of massive galaxy clusters, um, which implies that this could be what this galaxy turns into by the present day. Um, so we have this evolutionary sequence that I think we have reasonable evidence for from 
a massive burst of star formation and AGN activity in the past through this very compact remnant at redshift 4.7 or so through to something that's going to end up in the core of a very massive galaxy today, something like M87 perhaps. And of course, the puzzle being how this galaxy shut down its star formation, um, we know that AGN activity has the capability to do that. So I would argue that the very large amount of implied accretion into the AGN, the central black hole in the past of this galaxy, it's circumstantial evidence that that is what quenched this galaxy, given that it's unusual both in having a very massive black hole and in having shut down its star formation so early on in cosmic history. So um, that's the Cycle 1 project. Um, and I would just to finish off, like to very briefly introduce also my Cycle 2 program, um, which we're calling Excels. And this is really a comprehensive uh, population statistics type follow-up to the Cycle 1 program. We have these four 18-hour near-spec pointings that are going to cover various parts of the primary UDS field. And we're going to extend this search to about 20 to 30 massive quiescent galaxies at redshifts 1 to 5. So we should have the beginnings of a real population study to be able to um, look in detail about, about the whole um, diversity of these kinds of galaxies that we see popping up early on in the universe's history. Um, there's a few other ancillary science goals that I also think are going to be very exciting for this program that I don't have a huge amount of time to go into just now, so happy to talk to anybody interested about those. And the final thing that I'll just say is that uh, if you are interested in this work, um, I would uh, like to advertise that several of the people on this list, in particular me and Fergus, will be advertising for postdocs in the coming job round. And I very much uh, encourage you to apply if that's something that you think that you could be interested in. And I think that's about everything that I had to say. I'm almost out of time. Um, so I'll just say thank you very much for listening and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, thank you so much. So, um, Arini uh, Lambridi is NASA. Um, so, this trying to connect to the evolutionary picture of AGN and early quiescent galaxy, which needs to have a remarkably fast shutdown time to get to the quiescent galaxy C at U time at the, at the time that you're finding. Um, and so, you know, we've been trying for a long time at lower redshift to cosmic noon to make connections between AGN feedback and the shutdown of star formation. And the issue is very complex and at times very muddled and, and non-obvious how important AGN are in this regard. Are you suggesting that maybe something is different with AGN feedback that makes it more efficient at really high redshift? Or uh, are we in danger of repeating some of the mistakes we made in the more local universe? Uh, well, a couple of thoughts on that, I suppose. First of all, we're very much in the regime of quasar mode AGN feedback here, right? Whereas at lower redshift, it's more the sort of maintenance mode or radio mode that people talk about being responsible for maintaining the quenching. Um, quite when and how the transition between those two things comes, I think, is, is a matter for discussion still. Um, I think the other thing that's worth saying is that what's really... Um, Unusual, I guess, in this case is that we have a direct measurement of the black hole and the black hole mass in a quiescent galaxy, right? And that's something that we just don't see very often. We don't have access to very often because, first of all, this thing just presumably happens to be accreting a little bit at the moment, so we see it. And secondly, with the power of near spec, we have access to the rest frame optical and the H alpha line, which is something that we haven't even really had even at cosmic noon before. Um, so that's actually going to be something that we'll be working on in earnest um, with the Excels program is looking at these kinds of objects in the rest frame optical at redshift one to two and looking to see if we can pick up these kinds of signature. We'll take, we'll take one last question while we're switching uh, talks. So if you can stop sharing your screen, any last questions? 
Can you say something about the morphology of this particular galaxy? Is there uh, any evidence for this, or is it like getting towards becoming an ellipsoid? Well, it's kind of circular, which um, tells you it's either ellipsoidal or it's a, a face on disk. Um, but the reality of the situation is that it's only just barely resolved, even in the sort of bluer near cam bands. Um, so I think probably the answer, unfortunately, is it's not possible to say all that much about the morphology just yet, other than that it's very, very compact. Um, of course, at some point, hopefully later this decade, the European Extremely Large Telescope will be coming online, which should provide us an even um, higher resolution view of galaxies like this. Um, so I think that's the instrument that's really going to be necessary to start studying the morphology of this kind of galaxy in detail. Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. And the last speaker of the session, Tobias Losser. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, I would like to start by uh, thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. I'm certainly learning a lot and um, I'm having a great time. So I'm a third year PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. And today I would like to present uh, two of my recent uh, works, one of uh, a mini quench galaxy at redshift 7.3, and the second part, more observational evidence for Percy star formation histories in the first uh, billion years of um, cosmic times. So both these works have, done, have been done in collaboration with Francesco Lacenio, who is a postdoc in Cambridge, and my PhD advisor, Roberto Marolino, and with the great support from the entire Chates collaboration. So let me define what I, what I mean by saying <laughs> We, disc, uh, we found a mini quench galaxy at redshift 7.3. So a mini quench, potentially you hear me also say in quiescent phase, or even quiescent. Um, by that I mean uh, that we observed a galaxy with no or ne negligible star formation activity at the epoch of observation. I think that's very important because this means the quiescence of this galaxy, or the quenching state, can be uh, on short time scales in the framework of Percy star formation histories, as we have heard before during this conference but also leaves often the possibility that it might be quenched on longer time scales. Um, so why do I talk about mini-quenching? The main reason I'm talking about mini-quenching is the spectrum uh, we see here on the right. So this spectrum was uh, taken as part of our first um, Chates uh, deep near-spec observation uh, more than a year ago now, um, and had 28 hours of ex exposure time and was interestingly pre-selected as a Lyman break galaxy uh, observed by HST and was expected to be a star former due to its uh, UV brightness. And interestingly, we really uh, observed the sharp uh, Lyman alpha drop, um, putting the galaxy firmly at uh, redshift 7.3, 700 million years after the Big Bang, which is already very interesting. But the most crucial feature about this galaxy is that we observed absolutely no emission line, uh, plus um, a Balmer break. So, from uh, upper limits of nebular emission lines, we inferred a very low star formation rate upper limit of this galaxy, and with uh, an inferred mass of roughly five times, um, five times 10 to the eight solar masses from SED fitting, uh, we concluded that this is a quenched, uh, very early galaxy in the primordial universe. And due to its relative um, UV brightness, this makes this kind of a very rapidly quenched uh, or post starburst galaxy at very, very early times. So after this initial analysis, um, we investigated the galaxy in more detail, uh, running f uh, four different full spectral fittings codes on the galaxy um, in order to marginalize over different systematics and leverage the different strengths of these codes. So I don't want to go into too much detail here on the paper, but just to briefly summarize, all the codes agree that the galaxy have, has a mass of roughly 10 to the 8.7 uh, solar masses. All agree the galaxy is quenched and that the galaxy formed over a uh, rapid time scales forming roughly 40 to 200 mega years before the epoch of observation and quenching rapidly roughly 10 to 40 mega years before uh, observation. And all the codes indicate that the galaxy had a little uh, some dust. Um, so there could be two alternative scenarios to the galaxy being quenched. The fir first is that the galaxy could be a star forming uh, galaxy, with, uh, which is an extreme Lyman continuum leaker with a escape fraction of uh, at least 90%. Uh, 
However, we think uh, which could suppress the nebula emission. However, we think this scenario is favored, uh, first of all, due to the Palmer uh, break in the galaxy we observed, but then also indicating all the stellar populations, but then also tentative H delta absorption, uh, other um, um, Palmer absorption features. Um, the galaxy is blue, but not extremely blue, as you would, ex um, would you, um, expect for um, very high escape fraction galaxies, and also um, full spectrum fit because like Spiegel, which can model high es uh, escape fractions, prefer the Crichton solution, and galaxies which can, or uh, fitting codes which can decouple um, the star formation history from nebulization lines, looking at the stellar population alone, only infer all the stellar population, indicating galaxies quenched. The second possibility we can't rule out is that there's uh, completely obscured, obscured star formation going on. Um, however, we think this scenario is disfavored. Um, so I think then one very interesting question is which me physical mechanisms hold that star formation in this galaxy. It could potentially have been the UV background as invoked by some simulations for the epoch of reionization. Uh, which quenches uh, dwarf galaxies of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7, maybe 10 to the 8 solar masses. However, the higher mass of this galaxy suggests that this is probably this favorite for this object. What about the environment? Um, indeed, some simulations suggest that also at high redshift, environment can suppress the formation in, uh, in uh, epoch of reionization galaxies. Um, however, uh, in the case of this galaxy, we find no a uh, massive galaxy near, nearby, which um, disfavors ramp pressure strip and all the other environment effects as quenching mechanism. So arguably, due to the sto short star formation history we infer, infer and the rapid quenching of the galaxy, uh, we rather speculate that um, a short starburst phase followed by uh, quenching by our internal beat feedback, which could be feedback from star formation itself. Maybe a supernova feedback might act on too long sky scales, but the radiation driven outflows uh, could have quenched this galaxy. The other possibility is that also an AGN uh, event, uh, we know, for example, from GNZ11 that we have evidence for strong um, AGN driven outflows in high redshift galaxies. So, speculatively, rather one of those two feedback effects um, ejected the entire ISM out of the galaxy and quenched it like that. Another very interesting question is if the galaxy is only temporarily, or as we call it now, mini-quenched. Um, so indeed, as we have also heard this week, uh, some simulations predict this very bursty stochastic star formation histories at uh, very early times. Um, very interestingly, um, the mass of this galaxy is slightly higher than what is typically in, um, invoked for, for these effects, uh, but arguably we found the galaxy in such a mini-quenched phase. Another very interesting point, I think, is that many of these uh, simulations which invoke bursty star formation histories do not consider HN feedback. And recent work on um, HN feedback in, for example, uh, dwarf galaxies in the local universe by Kudmani et al., but also simulations by Lovell et al., suggest that HN feedback can already be quite powerful in low mass galaxies as well as at early times. So after um, investigating this, um, galaxy in detail, we moved on to study uh, burstiness um, at high redshift um, as part of the Chase scholar operation, looking directly at the stellar continuum. So what I show you here is the entire uh, Chase um, deep sample, the entire galaxy population consisting of 250 galaxies, plotted in three, def three different redshift bins in the star formation rate mass plane where the star formation rate is calculated directly from nebular emission lines. And color-coded here, it is something we directly uh, infer from the star formation hit histories, fitted with the non-parametric code PPXF. And what is uh, color-coded is the ratio between the star formation rate from the continuum over the last 10 mega time scales to the 90 mega years before. So this indicates in what kind of a burst phase the galaxy is, where white is in a strong burst phase, red in a roughly normal or constant phase, and, lull, and black in a lull or, or even a mini quenched phase. And what we infer, or what we see in the plot, is that above the main sequence um, here, galaxies are uh, preferably um, observed in a starbursting phase, 
And we see that particularly at the highest redshift, but also at lower masses, galaxies are um, preferentially observed in, in uh, bursts. So this raises a very interesting question, uh, I think, which, uh, which type of galaxies are uh, bursty and what can we say about the main sequence which I've uh, plot here for this sample, but which might be uh, strongly overestimated due to observability uh, bias. So in order to uh, investigate that, we plot, I plot here the um, um, burstiness indicator as before, um, here on the, in color coded, uh, in, in the um, redshift uh, stellar mass plane for our 250 galaxies. On the right, we have the same, just uh, using the um, information from star formation rating for the nebula continuum versus the longer time scale 100 mega years uh, continuum star formation rate. And we see that galaxies uh, at higher mass and lower redshift are often green, so in a roughly uh, constant phase, whereas particularly low mass and high redshift galaxies we observed in um, burst phases. So if these star formation histories are so bursty, where are all the lull and mini quench galaxies? Um, as discussed before, which also quantified, for example, in Sun et al., uh, we probably have strong observability bias in this sample. But we also start to see this kind of galaxies here at the redshift 4.5. We have a galaxy which is very uh, UV bright, um, strong beta slope, but has an emerging Balmer break and a weak nebula emission line. And the lull fa um, phase of this galaxy is also independently confirmed by the continuum. Or we have, for example, this galaxy at redshift 4.4, which is also lower mass in the mini quenched phase. And there are other interesting objects we have in, in JHRC, for example, also the post-star burst galaxy uh, from Victoria Strait. So after this analysis and burstiness, we took a step back and looked at the um, stellar ages um, or, uh, inferred by PPXF from all these galaxies. And we find that as was one would arguably expect, uh, particularly um, that galaxies are younger with increasing redshift and decreasing mass. And we also find it, uh, but interesting, we also find a, tr a strong trend with uh, delta main sequence. So this suggests that beyond the burstiness, there might also be uh, longer time scales, physics uh, shaping uh, star formation histories and galaxy evolution already at very early times. And we also find uh, trends with dust reddening of the stellar continuum, particularly the most, uh, the highest stretch of galaxies show evidence from some dust, which is very interesting. And then as one might expect, uh, more massive galaxies tend to be dustier. And interestingly, as one would expect, below the main sequence galaxies tend to have uh, less dust. Uh, which brings me to my conclusion. I think the discovery of this mini quench galaxy and more evidence on Percy star formation histories presented here, but also uh, in other talks during this conference and, and in the literature, shows that uh, JBS Diash is in the area in which we can constrain theoretical feedback models directly um, in the epoch of reanalyzation. Um, shed slide uh, of, on the interesting uh, mass and redshift transition between bursty and stable star formation histories, raising an interesting question, where is this um, transition between temporary and permanent quenching? Um, we have long and short time scales physics shaping galaxy promotion at early 